Welcome to Billionaire Romance Audiobooks. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel. It helps more than you know and is the best way to stay up to date on our latest releases. When you subscribe, you'll also get notified when we release new videos. Seducing the Surgeon A Single Daddy Romance Audiobook Book 4 in the Saved by the Doctor series By Michelle Love Audio Copyright 2023, BFA Publishing Note, we edited this romance audiobook to comply with the YouTube content guidelines. If you want to listen to the full-length non-edited version, you can grab a copy from Google Playbooks or Kobo. Blurb Love isn't something I care about. I'm attractive, I'm wealthy, and did I mention I'm famous? As the top surgeon in America, I can have anything I want. Any house, any car, any woman, anything. Except the new intern at the hospital. She's perfect in every way, but she's off limits. Will that stop me? I'm Royce Berkeley, I don't follow the rules. Chapter 1 I would like to ask you about the accident, John, the producer, says as he looks down at the paper in his hand. Can you finally tell us what happened that night? I freeze and my heart races. I specifically told him and the rest of the crew, I didn't want to talk about the night my wife died. It's the one subject I wish to stay away from, but it is the one thing I'm always asked about during interviews. I don't wish to discuss that, thank you. Next question, I reply. I've learned through the years how to answer reporters and their prying queries, but I have to admit, I am always caught off guard when they throw the issue at me. I constantly assume the next interview will be the one where I don't worry whether or not the painful topic is brought up. I understand it is a very painful memory for you, but as you know, the public has many questions surrounding what happened that night, and we are dying to give them some answers. If you'll give me a few moments of your time, he continues. The cameras are rolling, and I'm the only one in the frame. I'm used to these kinds of interviews, being named the best doctor in America for my show, Everyday Miracles. I am somewhat of a celebrity. Ever the charismatic, charming doctor on the show, it's been difficult for me to maintain the same level of enthusiasm in these sorts of interviews. Sure, I can talk all day long about cancer or open-heart surgery and the things I do to cure patients, but when it comes to my personal life, my darker side emerges. There's no denying I have a temper, but it's something that has never been caught on screen. I've worked hard to make sure that side of me stays under wraps, and I'm proud of it. People think of me as one of the most compassionate men on television, only helping and healing the sick and dying. Of course, there is a part of me that thrives on curing others, but it doesn't change the fact I am far from healed myself. My wife was the love of my life, my partner. She was the very air I breathed, and the essence of my existence. The fact she was ripped from me in a single instant has been something I've struggled with since the night it happened, doing my best to maintain my solitude and the privacy of my young son. I'll say it again, I don't wish to discuss the events of that night, I reply. Is that because there was more to the story than what was reported? I understand there were charges brought against you at the time, but with the help of a reputable lawyer, you were able to have all those charges dropped. Would you care to go into detail about those charges, he presses. A lot of information surrounding the incident has been filed away. I am not at liberty to discuss anything with the media, I lie. It's the only thing I can think of to get this guy off my back. I am forced to remain calm and cheerful, the doctor everyone loves. If I lose my cool over this, the ratings for the news channel will go through the roof, but my own ratings will drop. Daddy, a voice comes from the doorway. I jerk my head in that direction. My son is standing with his arms outstretched. It's clear he's been crying, and immediately the camera pans in his direction. I'm so sorry, Mr. Berkeley. I tried to reason with him, but he wouldn't stop crying until I brought him down here to see you. Sophie, my son's nanny, says as she looks through the door as well. Oh. Are you doing an interview? Cut the footage, damn it. I hiss. 
John gives the order and the cameras go off. I rise from my stool, yanking my microphone off in the process. What the hell, Sophie? How many times I have to tell you not to bring Maddox down here? I'm sorry, I didn't know what to do, she replies. I thought he'd stop crying if I brought him to see you for a few minutes. You take care of him like I pay you to do. I snap. I don't sign your paychecks to disregard what I say to do with him. I recognize that but you don't seem to understand just how, she begins but I cut her off. I comprehend the situation perfectly. Maddox isn't the problem, you are. I'll give you one last chance with Maddox. If you can't handle him, I'll find someone who can, I say flatly. She gives me a look and appears to start crying, but I don't care. The cameras aren't rolling, and the producer and crew know better than to get involved. Maddox, on the other hand, runs into the room and throws his arms around me. I kneel down and put my hands on his shoulders. Maddox, I told you, when I'm at work you have to stay with your nanny. I really need you to behave. I want to be with you, he cries. I don't like any of the nannies. Will you please excuse me for a minute? I ask, looking around at the TV crew. I know they want to turn the cameras back on and get a shot of Maddox, but if they do, all hell will break loose. I've been doing everything in my power to keep Maddox out of the spotlight. Ever since the accident, he has been as elusive to the public as the story itself. I don't want him to be the infamous child of the famous doctor whose mother died in a car accident, nor do I want him to grow up thinking of his mother that way. The crew steps out of the room and I sigh. Maddox, I know this is hard for you but I've got to work, you know that. It's how we get our money. I don't want money, he argues. We need money so we can eat food and live in our house, I explain. For a child as young as he is, I know he doesn't understand the concept, but I try anyway. Maddox, I want you to go back to the car with Miss Mary. I need to finish up in here. I page my assistant, and within a few moments, she appears. Yes? Mary, please take Maddox out to my car and sit with him while I finish up. I'll be out in a few minutes, I say. She nods and holds her hand out, giving him a welcoming smile. Come on Maddox, let's go outside, she invites. He clings to me, but once again I gently pull him off. Maddox, I need you to go with Miss Mary. I'll be out in a few minutes, I say, harsher than before. There are more tears in his eyes but he obeys. I stand up and straighten out my jacket and tie, trying to get back the charm I lost during the incident. When the cameras are rolling, I have to be the doctor people think I am, no matter what is going on in my life. It wasn't always this way. When Claire was alive, I didn't have to put on an act for television. I was the brilliant doctor who was outgoing and charismatic. She often told me I was the most contagious person she knew, and I loved her dearly. Sorry about that, I say when I ultimately find John. My son is a little excitable sometimes. It's not easy being a single parent, I get it, he replies with a smile. But listen, there's something else I want to talk to you about. I raise my eyebrows and cross my arms, expecting him to bring up the car accident once more. Let's face it. Your show holds some of the best ratings on television. The network is very impressed and they want to take it a step further, John says, moving his hands in an animated way. Oh. I certainly wasn't expecting that. Yes. What they've decided, is to have a spin-off of Everyday Miracles. They've already contacted several medical schools across the country, gathering a nice little group of fresh interns who have aspirations of being the next greatest surgeon, like you, he says with a smirk. And what will you do with these interns? I think I already know, but let him explain. They will come here, and you will work with each of them. Every week they vote one off and will narrow it down and blah blah blah, you know how it goes, he says. Yeah, I know how it goes. And a hospital is hardly the place for drama like that. I retort. Relax. All you need to do is what you do best. Give people instructions and observe, he teases. Think about it. Royce Berkeley, top surgeon in America, teaching the next generation a thing or two about the er. 
more like the OR. And I wouldn't say that's what I do best, I comment, but he is already moving on. All right. We'll be shooting within the next week or so. I hope you agree to the contract. He hands me a contract. I want to turn him down, but my eyes notice the payment. Over three quarters of a million dollars for ten episodes. That's hard to say no to. Doesn't seem like I have much choice. I scrawl my name on the dotted line and hand it back. John smiles. Oh, you've got a choice. I'm just happy to see you made the right one. Chapter 2 I I won. I stare at the email in disbelief. When I entered the contest for the new reality series, I never thought I had a chance of winning, but the email announces it, along with some instructions on what to do next. Oh my gosh! I say out loud once more. It doesn't matter that I am alone in the dorm room. I can't believe I actually won a spot on the show. Royce Berkeley has been my idol since before I was in high school. I saw all the shows he appeared on, and when he got his own program, I watched that religiously as well. Long before I entered medical school, I devoured all his books. Not only the books on healthy living, but also books on medical advice and how to become a doctor. I didn't want to be any doctor. I wished to be one of the best surgeons in America. Maybe even the world. I wanted to be every bit as good as Royce and I struggled to get through medical school to make that dream happen. I never thought I'd have the chance to meet Royce face to face, but I've often thought about what I would say to him if I did. I would tell him how much he meant to me, and what an inspiration he has been. I'd let him know he was the reason I got into the medical field, and show him I know what I am doing. My phone rings and I pick up. Kayla. I have a place on the show. My friend's voice comes through as she squeals with delight. Really? Me too. You did? She sounds both thrilled and shocked at the same time. That's awesome. My relationship with Monique has been strained lately. Though we were best friends when we arrived at college, we drifted apart over the years, and now we're more frenemies than anything else. I still refer to her as my best friend and try to think of her that way, but I know things aren't how they used to be. The rift came slowly in our relationship, and neither of us admit it's there. But the silent competition between us can't always be ignored, and I know she feels the same. It says here they're sending more information about where to go and everything, I mention as I skim the email. Maybe we'll get to stay together. That would be great, she says, but somehow there is a lack of enthusiasm in her voice. I know she wants to save the friendship, but it's difficult. In the back of my mind, I hope that this is our chance. It looks like we're leaving soon, she comments, and I review the email once more, suddenly realizing she's right. Shit, I've got to pack. Do you want to ride to the airport together? Sure, that's fine. It'll be best if we take a cab so we don't have to pay for parking, she replies. Plus, if one of us gets sent home before the other and the other cars at the airport, we'll need to get a cab to get home anyway. I roll my eyes. We're not even there, and she's already talking about one of us being sent home. Of course, we both know that will happen. There is only one champion at the end of the series. It's something neither of us has pointed out before now. I'm sure we can figure that out if it happens. As good as we are, we'll be right there together until the end. I try to sound optimistic, but I can also feel that competitive streak running through my veins. I want our friendship to flourish, but something in me wants to be the best. There's no reason why we can't support each other along the way, but with the way Monique presses for competition, I can't help myself. I mean, I think it's something we need to be prepared for. I'd hate to see one of us go home the first week when we thought we'd be there until the end, she says dryly. I cringe thinking about it. Something tells me this will be fierce. Of course. I was thinking positively, that's all, I utter, laughing. After all, Dr. Royce stated that positivity is one of the best medicines he has ever seen in his patients' lives. I'm sure you'll be all over what Dr. Royce has to say, she remarks almost with a sneer to her tone. I bite my tongue. 
I know she's always had a crush on the man as well, but not with the same dedication I do. In a way, it's as if she's jealous of my own knowledge about him. There are many ways I've felt that she's been envious of me in the past. I find it ridiculous to think this will be added to the mix, but I won't argue about it. I just want to go on the show and do my best. I doubt I'll be the winner, but I want to see how far I get. It's not entirely true. A part of me feels like I can, but I don't want to breed more tension between us. May the best of the best beat all the rest, Monique says with a chuckle. I agree and wrap up the conversation. Though I'd still like to talk, I have other things to do if I'll be in LA for the next couple months. I set my phone down on the bed and fall back on my pillows, letting my laptop slide onto the mattress next to me. My heart pounds and I take a deep breath. I can't believe it. I'm meeting Royce Berkeley. I try not to be bothered by what Monique said. I know one of us will beat the other, and I tell myself I'll be happy for her if she's the one. But deep inside, I have full confidence I'll win the title and get the prize. She thinks they'll send me home, but boy is she in for a big surprise. Chapter 3 Let's get this over with. I adjust the cuffs on my coat. Come on, you can't have that attitude when you're dealing with the next generation of surgeons. The viewers expect you to be the master while these people are your students, and it's up to you to mold them into miniature versions of yourself," John says with the same animated gestures he always uses. I roll my eyes. I'm not the master and they are not my students. This is for entertainment. You know that as well as I do. I know but the viewers don't, he argues. Come on, everyone loves your charming aura. Bring it to the table with these kids, and let's see what happens. Surgery and fighting to save people's lives isn't charming, I declare. It's as far as I get before we are at the door. He holds his hand up to stop me. The crew is filming by now, and the interns are lining up where they've been directed. Okay, you're on in 5432. He points me toward the door and I walk through. My shoulders are back and my head is held high. I hear the gasps of admiration escape from the lips of several of the interns. I walk to my mark on the floor and turn to them. Good afternoon, and welcome to Los Angeles Mercy Hospital. I trust you know who I am. The room fills with the sound of their hearty cheers, and I put my hands up to quiet them. I'm sure you're all very excited to be here. Eager to learn what it means to be a top surgeon. I'm certain you think you've got what it takes to climb to the top and beat all the people standing next to you. However, I'll tell you right now, that kind of arrogance will cost you dearly in the operating room. I look from face to face, but my eyes linger when I see a particular woman standing in the rear. I nearly do a double take when I notice her. She's slender, a brunette, has bright green eyes and a smile that immediately reminds me of Claire. In fact, at first glance, she could be Claire. I feel a twinge in my heart, and my voice nearly catches in my throat. I recover in time so it's not noticeable. I don't know this girl, but for some reason I immediately resent her. How can I not? She looks just like the love of my life. Claire was gentle and sweet. She wouldn't hurt a fly but also relied on me when times got tough. She was smart, so smart, but she wasn't the kind of woman who could keep herself together in an emergency. I immediately wonder if this girl will have what it takes to be a surgeon. I continue with my opening speech, but I find it difficult to concentrate on what I'm saying. It's almost as though I've taken a step outside of myself, now I stand and watch as I deliver the promises and threats, letting these interns know that I mean business. I may be easygoing and cheerful outside the OR, but when it comes to saving lives, I'm all about industry. I glance toward John who is standing behind the group. The camera is expertly angled so the viewers cannot see him, but I can make eye contact and respond to his direction without appearing like I'm doing so. He motions to ask the students questions. All right, so they tell me all of you have been in medical school for several years. I'm glad to hear that. I don't want someone who has no idea what they're doing on my floor. At this moment, I'm curious what they teach in school these days, get ready for your first test, 
I cross my arms and stand with my legs apart, clearly menacing to most of the group. The girl who looks like Claire is watching me like a hawk. She looks nervous, but there is an enthusiasm about her that most of the other students lack. She reminds me so much of my wife, and I can't take it any longer. You, I say pointing to her. She looks around, almost as though she is shocked that I'm talking to her directly. The cameraman motions for her to step forward, so she's in better view. She nervously obeys. Yes, she asks. What's your name? I reply. Kayla Grid from Chicago. I would like to say it's such an honor to meet you, she says quickly. I've been in love with you since. Tell me this, Miss Grid, I interrupt. You are at home with your family and it's Christmas Day. You're all having a good time and celebrating when your phone rings and you're called into the hospital. With the bad weather, it'll take you longer to get there, but a man arrives in critical condition. They are not sure what's wrong with him, an overdose perhaps, but they aren't positive. What do you tell them to keep that man alive until you arrive? I know it isn't a fair question, and I can clearly see nervous she is. Injecting him with more meds would be a bad idea, she fumbles, clearly guessing. I would put the head nurse over him until I get there. She speaks proudly, but I walk back and forth over the mark on the floor. So you are saying that when they call you for advice on how to save this man's life, or rather, how to keep him alive until you arrive, you will instruct them to have the head nurse handle it? There is a giggle among the other interns, and I see her cheeks flush red with embarrassment. She looks as though she's getting teary-eyed, but I turn my attention to the rest of the group. I would be interested to hear other opinions. Does anyone have a better answer? Please contribute. If not, listen and learn. I look from face to face but none of the students can hold my eye contact. They are shocked by the difference in the way I act on my own show and how I behave on the floor, and I'm enjoying it. I can see John from the corner of my eye, and he seems pleased with how the scene is going. The students stand silent, watching me like puppies waiting for instructions from their trainer. I look back at Kayla and realize there are light tear stains on her cheeks. Though she clearly is fighting them, her makeup betrays her. Miss Grid, is there a problem? The camera immediately focuses in on her and she looks anxious and irritated at the same time. She shakes her head quickly. Good. Because surgeons need to be calm and collected at all times, even when they are faced with intense tragedy. If you can't take the pressure, I'll thank you for not wasting my time. I have what it takes. I can handle the demands, she assures me. She glances toward the camera, but John motions to return her gaze to me. I can do it. She forces a smile, and I give her a solemn glance in return. Time will tell, I state plainly. And that's a wrap. John declares, breaking into the discussion. He walks into the center of the room, waving his hand, and the camera is cut off. The students are more relaxed without the cameras running, but still, there is a look of embarrassment on Kayla's face. All right, everyone, that was a good introduction. Miss Grid, I'll ask you to refrain from looking at the camera unless you are in an interview, and that goes for the rest of you as well. We are flies on the wall. You are here to learn from Royce. Forget about the rest of us, understood? He looks across the room as the interns nod in unison. Great. Take a half-hour break and we'll meet again right here at 1.30. Don't be late. He claps his hands and the interns head to the hallway. I shake my head, still watching Kayla, she looks a lot like Claire. It'll be tough to work with her. Chapter 4 I walk slowly up the hall, my cheeks burning with each step I take. I can't believe how the day has gone. It's nothing like I thought it would be, and I just want to disappear. I did everything in my power to impress Dr. Royce and everyone else on the set, but I feel foolish. Not only did his question take me by surprise, but I feel I was targeted with several of the others he asked throughout the day as well. It seems like, in some way, he sees me as a threat to the group, and he was making sure I stood out from the rest. I don't understand it, and I certainly don't like it. I can tell Monique is thrilled with the results. She instantly clicked with Dr. Royce, 
or at least that's how it appears to me. All the questions he asked her were correctly answered, though I feel he was far easier on her. As I walk, I'm not sure how the producers will decide who will stay and who is sent home at the end of the week. With the way the day has gone, I'm on the top of the list for being voted off, but they refuse to talk about it. I examine the plaques on the wall as I pass, filled with names of the different doctors and professionals who work in the offices. I can't imagine what it would be like to work with Dr. Royce every day. To be able to see him and talk to him, it would be incredible. He has a team he works with frequently, and they often assist him with what he does in the OR, but I wonder how often they actually have conversations with him. Suddenly, I see him round the corner. There are several other interns walking toward him, and he doesn't bother to make eye contact with any of us. Instead, he ducks into one of the offices, and my heart continues to race as I read his name on the door. It's his office. I take a deep breath, unable to believe what I'm about to do, but I know it's the right thing. I haven't made a good enough impression on him, and I have to. For my own sake, I need to. The door is open, so I poke my head into his office and he looks up in surprise. Can I have a minute? I ask timidly. He gives a slight nod. I walk inside, my heart racing as I do so. I just wanted to apologize for how today went. I know I can make it as a surgeon. It's just been a lot for me to come all the way out here and start being on TV and everything. I speak quickly, and he can probably see how nervous I am. I smile, anxious to keep my composure, waiting for him to say something, anything. If you think this is hard to handle, how will you manage an emergency situation with people's lives on the line? He pauses, and I jump in quickly. It's just nerves. I've never done anything like this before in my life, and I'm putting a lot of strain on myself, I explain. He's about to say something else, when suddenly a little boy bursts into the room. He looks like he's been crying, and he runs over to Royce when another woman suddenly appears in the doorway. What the hell? I made myself clear last time that you are not to bring Maddox down here. Royce snaps at the woman. She looks defeated and nods toward the boy. I know, but he's not listening to a thing I say and he's run out of the house three times today. I didn't know what to do, if I hadn't brought him down here he would have done himself, she explains. I hear the frustration in her voice but Royce doesn't care. Then you should watch him better, and make sure he doesn't get out of the house. You know what? I've given you plenty of chances, and time and time again you have proven to be incompetent. Expect your final paycheck mailed to the agency before the afternoon is over," Royce stated. The woman looks shocked and somewhat angry, but she doesn't argue. With a final look at Maddox, she shrugs. Thank you for the opportunity. She turns and walks out the door. Royce turns his attention back to me. You see, that's what happens if you don't meet my expectations. There is not one person who can't be fired, and no one who can't be voted off this series. I gulp, trying to hide it, but I'm positive he notices. I'm about to reply when his little boy pipes up, you look like my mommy. Surprised, I stare at him suddenly unable to think of anything to say. Royce quickly hushes the child, but I can see the little boy is really taken with me. He strolls around the desk, looking up at me with wonder and admiration. It's nice to meet you, I say at last. I'm not sure how to react to the circumstances. I knew Royce had a son, but not much about him. He's kept his son out of the public's eye, since the infamous collision Royce and his family had a few years ago. He has been mentioned only a few times in his books, and has never appeared on the shows Royce is part of. It's nice to meet you too, Maddox replies. What's your name? I'm Kayla. What's your name? I ask with a warm smile. Maddox, he says proudly. He's still staring at me, as though he's finding it hard to believe that I'm real. What a cool name. He grins as he puts his hands in his pockets, but he doesn't say anything. I prefer that you leave Maddox alone," Royce abruptly asserted. I don't let him socialize with the public. But I like her, Daddy. Maddox challenges. I want to be her to be my friend. Maddox, 
You are not supposed to come here when I am working. There is good reason for that, Royce announced flatly. I'm curious and a little glum. I am not the public, I am just an individual. I'm trying to be pleasant, but Royce's voice expresses how serious it is to leave his son alone. Maddox looks upset as he sits down in the chair opposite Royce's desk. He swings his legs and looks bored but I say nothing else to him. I can't imagine what it is like to be the child of someone famous, but kept out of the public's eye. Royce interrupts the silence. If that's everything, it's time for you to go. I return my attention to him, and see the concern about my interest in his son. The boy is captivated, and I don't know why. That's everything. I promise I will improve tomorrow, he doesn't speak, and only gives a curt nod. I awkwardly turn and walk out the door, still incredibly confused. What a strange interaction with his son. I can't help but wonder why he wants to shelter him away from everyone. I know it's none of my business, I've got more important things to worry about. I need to make a better impression on Royce, and I'm determined to make it happen. I don't care what Monique is doing with her afternoon, I'm going back to our room to study. Tomorrow ought to be better than today. Or I could very well be the first person sent home. Chapter 5 I look through the nanny profiles on the agency's website, but my mind wanders back to Kayla. I don't know why I can't get her out of my head. She resembles my wife but she doesn't behave like her. Kayla has more confidence than Claire, and it's not easy to reconcile it in my mind. It certainly didn't help the way Maddox was so taken with her. When he told her she looked like his mother, that only confirmed I'm not going crazy. There is a similarity. Being around her frustrates me. I can't help but think of Claire. Without even trying, I always compare the two of them. I can't help it. I miss my wife every single day, and often wonder why it wasn't I who died in the accident. Many times I almost wish we both had been killed. Although who then would have taken care of Maddox? Let's get ready to roll, John states as he knocks on the door to my office. I look up from the computer and he smiles. Today we'll take them into the OR and see what they've got. For the sake of the show, we've set up a dummy to see if they can make decisions to keep a person alive. Sounds dreadful. The last thing I want is to see what interns can do with a doll. I don't have the patience for it. Not today, not with everything else I have going on. We're already working on editing the first show, and it's set to air by Monday. I want to get out of the gates running. If the pilot has good reviews we need something to top it, John replies. I shake my head. I'll be there in a minute. He leaves and I sigh reclining in my chair and looking up at the ceiling. It'll be a long day, I already know that. I need to make the most of it. I just have to get through this series and move on with my life. The paycheck will be nice, that's what I have to focus on. I rise and walk to the door, eager to finish the shooting. I have other things to do with my day, but the contract requires that I comply with John's schedule. All the interns file back into the room, exactly as they did the day before. Reading from the teleprompter, I explain to them what we're doing with the dummy. Any questions? I demand, making a point not to look at Kayla, but I notice she's behind the group. After a brief pause I declared, all right, let us begin. We march into the staged operating room. I begin quizzing the interns on things they should have learned already, and I can't help but distinguish Kayla once more. A part of me wants her to fail. I want her to be sent home so I can forget about her and how much she reminds me of Claire. To my astonishment, she knows the answers to my questions and even volunteers more information besides what I ask her. I am impressed, though I'm not showing it. When you finish the surgery, suture up the patient before they awaken. Throughout this process, you will work very closely with your anesthesiologist ensuring that the patient does not rouse too early, I say. Kayla raises her hand. Aren't you supposed to be suturing the entire time? Closing up what you can when you can, she asks. We're trying to minimize trauma on the body, as well as blood loss. 
Yes, Kayla, thank you for pointing that out. Some people here might not be aware of that, I reply, but can't believe she had the audacity to speak up like that. Of course, what she said was implied, but I feel corrected. It infuriates and impresses me at the same time. It's clear by the faces of the other interns that they wish they had spoken up, but it's too late now. Kayla knows what she's talking about, and she has the confidence to express it. I like that about her. There is no second guessing about what she's doing, a remarkable change from the yesterday. The day wears on, and no matter how hard I try to catch her off guard, she's ready with an answer or a solution. She even knows how various medical tools work, and I'm pleased to see her use them on the dummy. She's a natural, and I'm convinced she'll make an incredible surgeon someday. Still, a part of me wants her to be the one who's sent home. At the same time, it's clear she's working hard to stay. She's not going out without a fight, and right now, I'm getting the impression she outranks most of the others in the group. And that's a wrap. John finally states, I'm relieved that it's finally over, and I can turn my attention to getting a nanny for Maddox. It's difficult knowing he's coming back down to the office this afternoon. The babysitter I hired can only stick around until she has to go to work herself. The sooner I can get another sitter, the better. Kayla, I'd like to speak with you in my office, I mention as the interns disperse. She looks surprised but follows me. I wanted to say you did an impressive job today. I didn't suppose you would stand out from the others so well. You should be proud of yourself. Thank you I am, she replies with a grin. And I promise that it's just the beginning. Keep up the good work. That's all. She smiles and my heart skips a beat. I can't deny that I like her. I like her a lot and I'm certain it shows. She seems to know it. She appears more confident as she turns to the door. You again? Maddox asks when he sees her. I cringe. I didn't know he would be back so early and hoped Kayla would be gone by the time he returned. Sorry, I know we're a few minutes early but I got called in to work, Sue says as she appears in the doorway. Oh, I didn't know you were with someone. Never mind, I respond. He can come in. I was heading out anyway, Kayla says. It was good to see you again, Maddox. You remembered my name. Maddox beams. Kayla stops and I bite my tongue. I don't want Maddox to get too cozy with her. He too, is being reminded of his mother when she's around, and I'm afraid it's not good for him. It took him a very long time to come around after the car accident, and while we never talk about it now, I worry that him being around Kayla will bring back memories he should forget. Of course I remembered, how could I forget meeting someone as awesome as you, she asks. I suppose since she admires me so much, she knows what happened. I'm glad she had not brought it up. I'm tired of talking about it, or even thinking about it. I don't want it to be something she and I talk about. At the same time, I'm struck with how well she gets along with Maddox. She's a natural, that's for sure. I almost wish she was available in the day to watch him, but I could never ask her to do such a thing. Well, I better get going, she exclaims, glancing back at me. She's probably thinking of when I told her not to interact with Maddox, and for a brief moment, I regret it. I'm letting it go for now, I have more important things to fret about. See you tomorrow. I don't know why. I can't help it. I like the girl. I like the girl a lot. Chapter 6 I can't believe how time flies. I've been spending all my free time studying different medical books, especially those written or endorsed by Royce. Of course, I have read his medical books, but since I'm doing this series, I really want to prove to him I know what I'm doing. We've been filming for five weeks. I must admit, I think I'm getting the hang of things. I am more confident on camera, and I'm not afraid to speak up or share my opinion. The producers love any kind of drama that comes up, and they seem to encourage it. Of course they are subtle about it, ensuring they catch it all on camera without the interns presuming they have any of it. I am also pleased with how Royce and I have been connecting. 
I've never felt this way about a man before in my life. It's not only an old admiration or the crush I've had on him for years. I feel we are connecting on a whole new level. I'm falling in love with him. I can't help but think he's falling in love with me too. The way he looks at me, the way he interacts with me, is different from other interns. There's a bond between us I'm not imagining. Not to mention, I like to see his son, every chance I get. Maddox is a sweet child, and there's no denying that the boy adores me. I noticed Royce is more relaxed with me talking to his son too. I can't help but feel encouraged by it. Perhaps there really is something there. Why the hell are you studying again? Monique asks when she walks into the room. I roll my eyes. Though I wanted the show to bring us back together, it has only proved to put more tension on our relationship. It doesn't help that only a handful of us remain, and each week we get closer to one of us going home. I want to do well, I reply. You already show off more than anyone else. I don't know why you bother, she says dryly. I don't show off. I like to do my best. So you can get more of Royce's attention? Monique asks. You know that's why you're doing it. No, I'm doing it because I don't want to get voted off the show. I snap. I feel defensive when she talks about Royce. I know she's jealous of my rapport with him. It's obvious every time she brings it up. Sure, and that's why you spend so much time in his office when we are not shooting, she replies snidely. I don't know what you're talking about. Now will you please leave me alone? I'm trying to study. You are just in denial, she replies. Otherwise, why would you get so defensive about it? I'm defensive because it's not true. I'm trying not to raise my voice, but it's difficult. She's annoying me and not helping the situation. I still believe she's only doing this out of jealousy, and I want her to stop. It's none of her business what I do with my free time. What happened to you? she asks. What happened to us? You know there was a time when we'd never argue about something like this, but it's all so different now. I sigh. She's right, but I don't know how to fix things. I don't know. I miss the way we were. You've changed a lot over the past couple years, she observes. When we got to graduate school, it's like something changed. You've changed quite a bit yourself. I'm defensive once again. It's not just me. Perhaps it's that we're getting older. I don't understand it. There was a time when I thought we'd be best friends forever, she says with another sigh. Well, you can always try being nicer to me. You are the one who's unbearable. Here I am trying to fix what we had and you tell me I'm unbearable, she snaps. She's clearly angry now but I don't care. All you do is spend your time reading and trying to show off. You do anything you can to look better than me. She shakes her head. I chuckle. You hate it when I do better than you. I'm just the girl who was supposed to stay in your shadow my entire life. I utter. The anger returns and I'm not in the mood to back down. You've always been jealous of me, she responds with another laugh. You've been mad that I am prettier than you since kindergarten. I always topped you in everything and you can't stand it. So what? Are you trying to get back at me now? To prove you can do something with your life. Get out. I yell. Just get out. You know what? F you, she shouts back. This is my room too. This was a terrible idea, and I don't know why I let you talk me into trying to get on the show in the first place. I went along with it because I wanted to reconnect with you, after all this time. You came with plans to beat me, and now since it's not working you're having a fit. I argue. I know you well enough. You can't stand not being in the spotlight. Well guess what? I'm not in your shadow anymore, and I'm not going back. I'm leaving. I'm sick of the drama, and I'm sick of watching you flirt with Royce. You're making a fool of yourself on reality television, and I'm done being a part of it. Monique walks over and grabs her suitcase from under her bed, plops it on top, clicks it open and begins shoving her clothes inside. So this is it. 
I ask, shock in my voice. You're walking away from all of this. If you think there's something going on between me and Royce, and I can tell you right now there is not, that's not good enough for you. You have to prove a point by leaving. I'm done with this. I didn't want to be on TV in the first place, and this whole show is rigged. You are the one who'll win, that's already been decided. They will keep up with the drama until the end, and then something will go down with you and Royce, she says without looking at me. Nothing will go down because nothing is going on, I say, trying to be calm. Part of me is relieved she's leaving. This way is a lot easier than one of us being voted off and sent home. At the same time, I'm terrified to think of being in LA all alone. Though I've made friends with a few of the other interns, as well as with some of the staff at the hospital, it will not be the same with Monique gone. All right then. Fine. Be that way. I say when she doesn't reply. I return my attention to the book in front of me, but there's no way I can concentrate. Monique is leaving, and there is nothing I can do about it. I'm not begging her to stay, and I will not try to convince her of the truth when she has her mind made up. I'll go on to win the title of top surgeon because of my skills, not because of what's going on with Royce. I don't need to bribe anyone. I'm good at what I do, and that's what carries me week after week. Monique shuts her suitcase and slams the door behind her. I'm alone. It's true, she is gone and I'm staying. I sigh, shake my head and think. Part of me feels guilty, but there's a bigger part of me that doesn't care. After all, it's like Royce always says, if you can't stand the pressure, get out. Chapter 7 Kayla, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to see you in my office, I say at the end of the taping. Kayla smiles. I know she doesn't mind. I invite her to my office often and talk about different things. At first, I only wanted to converse about how things were going with the series, but with time, I started to look for reasons to be alone with her. I enjoy spending time with Kayla. She's beautiful, smart, and though she still reminds me of Claire, I've come to appreciate her individuality. I don't even mind Maddox hanging out with her at the hospital. I'm still hunting for the right nanny, and until I find a suitable one, he's been visiting me in the afternoons. We walk to my office and I close the door after her. I want us to have some privacy today. Have a seat, I tell her as I walk to my own chair. She sits down on the opposite side of my desk and smiles with expectation. I wanted to ask you if everything is all right. It seems like you were a little off today. Even now, she looks upset but is trying to hide it. She sighs with a tired smile. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm just stressed with Monique going home. I mean, I tried to make her to stay, but she wouldn't listen. I've been thinking about what you said, and I guess she couldn't keep up with the rest of us, so it's better that she left, she says with resolution in her voice. There's a part of me that thinks she's trying to convince herself as much as she's trying to give me a logical explanation. The producers told me she decided to leave. That'll make things a little more difficult with the show. I think they'll bring someone in to replace her, so the show runs for the entire 10 episodes. I know we aren't supposed to be giving the contestants a lot of inside information, but things are different with Kayla, she will not chatter about what's going on. Oh boy, that will only make things harder for me, she says with a grin. I laugh. I like her confidence, and I know she thinks she'll win. I hope she does, but I'm not entirely sure how the producers will choose who goes home. They make it seem like the interns vote, and the final decision is up to me, but I think John has a lot more say in the matter than he lets on. I'm sure you'll define. You have improved in the past few weeks. You've been incredible. She blushes and I smile. She's gorgeous, but still obviously intimidated by me. She wants to make a good impression. We've known each other for over a month and flirt with each other almost daily. I can see she's not entirely sure of herself around me. I've been working hard. There's a lot of practice and studying that goes into my day, she says modestly. Keep up the good work. I'm pleased with your efforts, and if there is anyone here I would like to see at the end, it's you. What is the award for this? 
They give us a cash prize, and I'm pretty sure a job interview with the hospital of our choice, she says with a shrug. I'll need to be out of school before I can think about that. Maybe this could be your hospital of choice. I tease. You've already got the ropes down, and you know the layout of the place like the back of your hand. I've seen you in the halls, it's like you've been here forever. I'm good at learning new things, she says. I think that's why the studying is helping me so much. While everyone else is out partying, I'm in my room, learning about the cardiovascular system and muscle tissue. In the end, it'll all pay off. I know for now it might not seem worthwhile, but it's significant in the long run. When you have the career and the life that goes with it, while the rest of them are scrambling to make ends meet, you'll realize it wasn't a big deal to stay in that room when the rest of them were being dim-witted. I say with a smile. I remember when I was your age, I spent an awful lot of time in solitude. I didn't think that it had any merit, but now look where I am. There's no way I would have this level of success in my life if I hadn't worked hard for it then. I don't want to sound pushy. And I really don't want to sound like her parent, but at the same time, I want her to understand what she's doing is important and while she might feel she's missing out on the fun now, it'll work out in the end. I would love nothing more than to see her succeed in life. It's unlikely we will stay in contact when the series is over, I still want to learn about her success one day. She looks at me with bright eyes. I can tell my words have an effect on her. I don't know if it was worth losing my friendship with Monique over this. I mean, she and I have been friends forever and things hadn't been going that great between us for a while. I hoped that by coming here we'd be able to reconnect and maybe salvage what we had. I shake my head. I'm confident Monique is a very nice girl, but you have to understand there are times when the people you care about are the ones who hold you back in life. She probably didn't mean to, and you may reconnect with her in the future, but right now you need to focus on what is right for you. Being with someone who is holding you back isn't what's best. Do you think she was holding me back? Kayla is genuinely shocked. I nod. I saw the way she treated you, in front of the camera. There definitely was a lot of jealousy, and it appeared like she wanted to see you fail. That's not a true friend, I declare. She looks down to think it over. No doubt there are a lot of emotions going through her, and she doesn't know what to think. However, I need to move on with my day, so I clear my throat and she looks up once more. I smile. I'm glad you came to talk to me, and I want you to know that I'm proud of the way you handled things with your friend. It's not always easy, but you did the right thing. Better get out of here and hit the books again. I have to run some errands, I say, looking up at the clock. She rises and holds out her hand with a smile. Thank you so much, Dr. Royce. I ascend to shake her hand, but at the same time a shooting pain runs through my leg. I whimper and grab my knee. Are you all right? she cries. I'm fine. I was in a car accident a few years back and got injured. It's nothing serious, I reply. Let me look at it, Kayla says as she walks around the desk. I shake my head. It's fine really, I insist, but she doesn't listen. If you haven't had it looked at in some time, and I'm guessing you have not, it would be wise to let me see it. It never hurts to get another opinion, she says as she kneels next to me. I know I'm okay, but the compassion and concern in her eyes make it clear she's genuinely worried about me, and I can't turn her away. She needs this kind of practice if she's learning how to deal with real patients. But there is one thing that's apparent, she'll make a damn good doctor one day. Chapter 8 I delicately examine Royce's leg, not even thinking about what I'm doing. It was instinctive to come forward and examine him when he's hurt. Of course, he knows what he's talking about. I'm already aware of the car accident he's referring to, but since it happened almost five years ago, I can't imagine he should have much pain today. As I feel his leg, I detect the damage to the tendons around his kneecap and notice there isn't much padding in his joint. He grimaces under my touch, but I'm being as gentle as I can. I need to get used to this if I am to work with patients on a regular basis. I think you are correct, 
but why don't you have it taken care of? I look up into his face. Once again, I'm immediately struck by how handsome he is, and embarrassment creeps into my mind. I don't want to be out of the game for long. There is nothing I can't live with, and it will get worse over time. When it becomes unbearable, I'll have to do something about it, but right now I have work to do and a son to take care of, he replies. You know I would be delighted to take care of Maddox for you if you ever need, I blurted out. I stop myself. What am I saying? When we're done filming the series, I'm heading back to Chicago, and if he requires knee surgery, he'll be out for months. Where would I stay? How could I afford that? That's very kind of you. Your manners are spot on, Roy says with a smile. My heart melts. I still blush, looking at his genuine smile. It is dissimilar to the professional and polite smiles he gives. I feel a connection between us and he's holding back. I guess I better go study, I confide and Royce chuckles. That's all you do, isn't it, he teases. Hey, it is essential if I'm going to be as good as you one day. You said so yourself, I flirt. So you better get going. I'll see you tomorrow, he replies. I grin and walk toward the door. I hesitate for a moment before turning the knob, yet once again my mind goes blank. There are so many things I want to tell him, but silence seems best. Before I leave, I simply throw him a smile over my shoulder as he winks at me. Life couldn't be better. Chapter 9 I don't know, you seem peculiar, John confesses as he looks at me with his no-nonsense stare. You know me well enough to determine if I'm behaving differently? I challenge him. I know you pretty well, he argues. We've been working together for months. You know what I'm like on screen. Besides, it's not like we hang out together, I say dryly. He shrugs. All right. Try to find your old self by the time you get on screen today. We'll add some escalating drama for the interns. We're in the final few weeks. We need to intensify things to maintain the ratings. I don't check ratings, I reply. I can't say I care enough. Well, you really should start watching the show. You've got a few episodes to catch up on. You could do it in a night if you wanted to, John says cheerfully. He gives me a few more tips before leaving, and I'm immediately relieved when he does. I know John. He will eat up the fact that I slept with Kayla, and won't hesitate if he has the chance to get any of it on film. He's right. My behavior was out of the ordinary. The fact of the matter is that I'm utterly infatuated with Kayla. I can't get her off my mind. And I don't want to get her off my mind. I'm not sorry foe slepping W with her, not in the least. But it was a mistake. I will not be caught up in a relationship with a contestant from the show, especially not a woman who's 13 years my junior. Though, I have to admit, at 24 years old, she demonstrates a lot of technique. She may be wise beyond her years, but that doesn't change the fact that it could turn into a scandal. I don't want that for either of us. No, as tough as it will be, we have to stop this before it gets more complicated, which means we're going back to the way it was before. I won't be Mr. Nice Guy anymore. No, Miss Grid, I'm afraid that's incorrect. You're losing your edge, is there any particular reason why? I ask. The cameras are rolling, and it's clear by John's expression that he's thrilled with the drama that's now unfolding. Kayla looks at me, astonished. She's not sure how to handle the change in my disposition toward her, and she's visibly hurt by it. But I feel I don't have a choice. I need to keep her at arm's length, no matter how badly I want to pull her closer. I can't entertain thoughts of us being together when there's no way it could happen. She'll finish the series and return home to Chicago. I'll go back to the life I've known for the past five years. This was only a fling. It's something I can live with but can't continue. And break. John says at last. All the interns look relieved. Though there are only a few of them left on the show, they're incredibly stressed. I'm still thinking Kayla will walk away as the champion. All of them hope they will win. Every week each one advances further, 
and the competition is high. There is always a break in shooting halfway through the day, as John reviews some of the events. Sometimes he wants to go back and expand on certain elements, other times he tells someone to vary what they are doing altogether. The one thing I hate about reality TV is how staged it is. Kayla makes eye contact with me as soon as we are free to talk, but I ignore her. I turn and head for my office, eager to get out of the same room she's in. I refuse to look over my shoulder in spite of the fact I feel her eyes on me, and glancing in the reflection of a window, I see a look of confusion on her face. I feel like such a jet K. She must be terribly confused by the situation, but there's no way I can talk to her about it. She obviously thought we'd be closer than ever, but with the wall I have to put up, she'll feel intensely rejected. Royce Royce. John calls out as he catches up to me in the hall. He's the last person I want to talk to right now. Well, besides Kayla. I pause for him to catch up to me. I don't know what the hell you're doing, but keep it up. The viewers will love the sudden change in your dynamic with Kayla. It'll be the talk of the media. I'm not really listening to what he says until he brings up the fact that it's changing the dynamic. I stare at him with raised eyebrows. What do you mean it'll change our dynamic? Oh come on, you don't have to watch the show to know that the two of you are known for your flirting. It's been going on for weeks and trust me, the audience loves it. John comments, elation in his voice. Actually, I don't know what you're talking about, I say coldly. He shakes his head. Ever the professional, right? That's okay, it'll help a lot with a sudden change. Picture this. The young, naive intern who falls in love with a charming doctor is suddenly given a different message. A pang rings through my chest. I feel like a bigger jerk than I did before. Admittedly, I have been friendlier with Kayla than I probably should, but I couldn't help it at the time. I'm not convinced I can help it even now. It'll be torture to put Kayla and myself through this. It will be worse knowing the entire world is watching this unfold. I'm glad you're happy with how things are going. Excuse me, I have a few things to do before we start shooting again, I articulate. I want to get away from him as soon as possible, though I have to admit talking to him keeps Kayla away. Yes yes get it done. Actually, we're taking a surprise turn with the contestants to see how they handle a local clinic rather than something this intense. Think of it as a genius who can't tie his own shoes, John says as he clasps his hands together. You're giving me a free afternoon? That will work great for me. I could use it to catch up on other issues. Great. I'll let you go and see you tomorrow, he says enthusiastically. I can't imagine having that kind of personality, but I'm relieved knowing I don't have to see Kayla that afternoon. Great, I grumble. Have a good day. I step into my office before he goes off on another subject, closing the door behind me. I lean against the door for a few moments, trying to gather my thoughts and sigh. I can't get Kayla's look out of my mind, or forget the day before when I had her on top of my desk. I'm as baffled as she is, though I know it's the right decision. I have to ignore the feelings spinning in my mind and focus on getting through the series. Kayla is young and beautiful. She'll forget about me and move on as soon as we're through. It will not be easy for either of us, but it's worth it in the long run. I can't think about it. I've got to move on. After all, this is the right thing to do, isn't it? Chapter 10 Come on, Kayla, you've got to focus. What are you doing, babe? John asks with a clap of his hands. I hate that we've gone to a local clinic to shoot this afternoon. I wish Royce had come along too. A common mistake many doctors make is thinking a patient exists who is below their skill level and pay grade. A good physician is willing to treat anyone, no matter what the problem is. Do your best to cure someone, the doctor bellows to all of us. I'm having a difficult time concentrating on what he's saying and what they want us to do for the episode. They give us directions, but I feel as if I'm messing up. Royce won't get off my mind. There must be a reason why he pulled back so abruptly, 
but for the life of me, I can't comprehend what. All right, it's time to move on. Who can tell me the sequence of admitting a patient? This is basic knowledge, people, you should know this, the doctor says, making eye contact with all of us. I know the answer, but for some reason I can't articulate it. My tongue is tied, and for the life of me no words will come out. Another intern raises their hand, and the doctor calls on him. I listen in embarrassment, as he gives the correct answer. Unbelievably, I just let the opportunity pass by. Back at the hospital, I feel like the star of the show. But here, I feel almost out of my element. Is it because Royce isn't here? There's no doubt he'll learn about this. John has a way of spreading news faster than a high school teenager. The afternoon drags on, every hour ticking by is pure agony. Not only am I more quiet than usual, but when I get called out, I say the wrong things. Small mistakes here and there but enough to notice. I'm fumbling, I want to break down and cry and I'd like to disappear. I feel like this is my first day all over again. I want nothing more than to lock myself in the dorm and forget. That's it, I'm going to talk to Royce. Okay, I think overall it went all right. John evaluates with a grin as we pack into the vans. Some of you surprised me. Some in a good way, others in a less than thrilled sort of way. I will not disclose the names. Let's say some of you stepped up to the plate today while others nearly struck out. It will be interesting to see what happens at this week's elimination. I cringe, knowing he's referring to me. To make matters worse, I know he's right. I can't say I did my best this afternoon. I tried but managed not to come through. Not for myself, anyway. By the way John is behaving, there's no denying he's content with how the day ended. Ratings, that's all he cares about. Everyone can return to the hospital, then go back to your quarters. There is nothing else to do here today. Any questions? John inquires, looking around the room. You can hear a pin drop. John is intimidating. Most of the time, he is repulsed by the questions we ask. Quickly, we figured out to check with the studio rather than talk to him directly. Great. We've reached an understanding. You can relax this evening, he says as he motions to a van. We pile in, but I hold back to get the closest seat to the window to get lost in my own thoughts. The van door closes and we're off. I'm glad everyone else gets the hint. I've noticed they're reacting differently toward me. It feels as if they're holding back after Royce spoke to me this morning, as if they can sense there is something unusual. I remember what Monique told me before she left. Everyone thinks something is going on between us. I am inclined to think they noticed our relationship more than I realized. It seems they know better than to comment, but I am certain there will be gossip once we part. The ride to the hospital is a quiet one. No one has much to say after the afternoon. I have an impression no one is happy with their performance at the clinic. I hope we don't have to deal with that again. To be honest, in retrospect, no one did as well as they could have. There's no doubt in my mind that this episode will be the talk of the internet when it finally airs, the only thing John desires. For the ratings, he'll put us through as much drama as he can. I also dread think that he'll get wind of the fact that there is something going on with Royce and me, and he'll start playing on that as well. Things like this I need to disregard. As we pull into the parking lot, I unfasten my seatbelt, eager to get out of the van and back inside as soon as possible. I need to catch Royce, I have to talk to him. I'm prepared it will not go well. No matter what he says to me, I will not break down and cry. Royce likes people who can hold their composure, even when they are dealing with stress. I am an adult. I can handle the truth, no matter what it is. Certainly, I'm not looking forward to it and my anxiety is through the roof pondering what he will say, but we need to get it out in the open. I can't go through another day like today. It's tough for me to focus, and if I don't get myself together, I'll be facing elimination. I dash through the hall toward Royce's office. He's always there after the taping. Curiously, he didn't go with us to the clinic. 
he's probably doing some paperwork or balancing his schedule with the series and his own TV show. He manages both, along with life-saving surgeries, and it makes me admire him all the more. Doctor, can I have a minute? I ask, knocking on the door to his office. There's no answer, so I knock again, this time a little louder. He's not here, the secretary remarks from her desk. He left about 15 minutes ago. Is he coming back today? I feel he deliberately left before we got back. He's avoiding me, and I don't understand why. I doubt it. When he leaves in the afternoon, it's rare for him to return. Won't you see him in the morning, she quizzes. Yes, there was just something I need to talk to him about, I say. She gives me a look and I quickly add, certainly it can wait until tomorrow. She seems satisfied. I wish there was a way for me to find him. I don't know where he lives, and he only gave me the number to his work phone, something he only answers during the day. There's no way for me to reach him, so I'm just going to have to wait until morning. I decide to go back to my room and concentrate on my books, though it's something I need to wrestle up. I'm thinking about the day before and how cheerful I was leaving his office, then compare it to the gloom I'm experiencing now. This has become rather complicated, and I need to figure out a way to clean up the mess. It all begins with talking to Royce. Chapter 11 Oh my gosh! Ratings through the roof, people! I can't believe this. Well, I can, because I'm the one producing it. Who would have thought watching a bunch of kids becoming doctors would be so popular? John exclaimed. I roll my eyes. I managed to catch up with the show and I must admit, it is well done, but I can't see how it's any better than the one I host myself. Everyone else in the room cheers, so I join in with the clapping though I'm really not excited. Admittedly, watching me on the show unveiled my callousness toward Kayla. It was bad in the beginning, though it dissipated as we flirted with each other. Seeing how I flipped on her, I'm worse than I was in the beginning. The editors were vigilant to include all the pained looks on Kayla's face, as well as to edit the interviews to make them appear more theatrical than they actually were. At times I wish they would include my private interviews. Bad enough with my effort to keep my son out of the limelight, I don't want the media to suspect he might be getting a new mother, which is something I run across more than once as I read through the commentary on the show. Today, we are focusing on the competitive aspect of the show. We are down to the final four contestants, and thankfully two of them have been favorites for a long time. I want to set up some drama between Kayla and Mercedes. Let's see if we can get one of them sent home this week, John says as he clasps his hands together. My heart skips a beat. A part of me wouldn't be opposed to Kayla being sent home. I know it's a terrible consideration. I want to see her do well on the show, but at the same time, I can't be around her without being driven crazy. Reminiscing about her on my desk. I would love nothing more than to do it again. In fact, to take her somewhere with more privacy and tear all her clothes off. Her slender tight body in those scrubs. There is no denying I'm insanely attracted to her, there's nothing I can do. How should we do that, one of the other crew members requests. Quietly, they've been setting up scenarios throughout the season. They are good at it. At times I wonder if the interns even know what's happening. They take the bait so well, sometimes fighting or arguing as though the cameras aren't surrounding them. No one seems to notice many of the things they argue about are encouraged on the other side of the cameras. I don't really care. As long we get some drama or tension between them. I wish Monique had lasted longer than she did. You know, with the friendship aspect of it all. It would have been nice to include that breakup, John says with a shake of his head. This guy is more heartless than many people discern. He only cares about the show. As long as he sees those five stars day after day, He'll push everyone harder, creating more apprehension and spectacle until someone breaks and is given the walking papers. I don't understand why the world feeds on such anxiety, but it's what people want to see. It's as if his show brings out the dark side of the medical industry, 
and how cutthroat doctors can be to one another as we compete to make it in the field. I remember it from the days I was starting out, and John is embracing it now. Though he tends to leave me alone and focus on the interns with his farcical schemes, I look forward to when the shooting for the show is done. I'm tired of being part of it, and I want out of the contract. Thank God there are only a few more weeks to go. All right everyone, let's kick some dust. The interns will arrive any minute, and I want to film as they come through the door. Get a good shot of Kayla's face. John moves to his normal seat. I sigh, preparing to be in front of the camera once more. The interns walk into the room. They look tired, and Kayla is looking worse than the rest. Dark circles are visible under her eyes, and though the makeup crew did their best to minimize the appearance of them, it's still obvious she's exhausted. She's doing this to impress me. To get back in my good graces ever since that day. I wish I could tell her the truth. I want her to know how much I care for her. It kills me to be so tough on her, but there's no way we can be together. I just can't bring myself to do it. If I were to bring her into my office to talk to her, she'd end up on the desk again, making matters only worse. She's avoiding eye contact with me, or even interacting with me. I make a point of calling her out. I know John enjoys it, and the viewers seem to like all the screen time she gets. She manages to keep up with the answers and hold her ground. She'll make a damn fine surgeon one day, and I would love nothing more than work with her side by side at this hospital. Nope, I have to stick to my guns and continue to treat her like I have. It's the best way to keep her from falling in love with me, as complicated as it is. Although deep down inside I've already fallen for her. And I've fallen hard. Chapter 12 I admit, I'm exhausted and don't know how much longer I'd do this. I'm spending all my time studying or volunteering at the hospital, trying to obtain as much knowledge as possible. Working as a volunteer at the hospital is more pleasurable than filming the series. So much less drama. And I am actually helping people. It's becoming increasingly clear that Royce is avoiding me. He wasn't happy when I asked to stay and work after the filming, but he didn't stop me. I look for a chance to talk to him, but he's occupied with other issues. I will not see him in his office anymore. In fact, he seems to finish things up in his office while the producers interview us, making sure he's able to leave as soon as possible. I've been trying not to overdo, but it's difficult for me to contemplate. I'm angry with Royce. I feel used in a way. Only a few days ago I was confident there was more to it, but with the way he's been acting, I'm not so sure. I want to speak with him, but he's not letting me. Another part of me wishes I could talk to someone else about it. I wish I could call Monique and get her opinion, but she'd freak out. She already accused me of having something going on with Royce, and if she finds out he and I got funky, she is likely never talk to me again. But I need advice. All right, things are winding down with the show. A few of you remain competing for the title of Top Surgeon. It's time to do actual simulations, John announces when we line up in our usual places for the introduction. What does that mean? Mercedes asks. I dislike the girl, but I've been careful to hide it. I know John can sense the competitive pressure between us, and he's doing what he can to promote it. Nevertheless, I'm fighting it as much as possible. I don't want to make the situation worse. It means you have to pay attention and bring your a game. No one is safe from elimination, although you and Kayla have points on your side. I want to remind you both that those can be lost if you screw up in here, John explains with a grin. I don't understand his scoring system, but I don't question it any longer. He knows what he's doing, and I need to roll with the punches. All right. We'll open the show with an explanation of what you are doing, so we can cut to the chase with the filming, he confers. We receive a series of instructions for the activity, and I relax. I can do this without any trouble, but how well can Mercedes handle it? Kayla, I'm starting you with the monitoring machine. You will monitor the pseudo-vitals and keep the dummy alive. 
after Mercedes, you will switch places. We'll give James a chance afterward. John pulls up the monitor, and my heart leaps into my throat. Out of the blue, I don't care about winning this round. This is the chance I've been waiting for. Even volunteering with the hospital, I haven't been allowed to use their computers. The files contain too much private medical data to access them. But it's not the medical files I'm interested in. I set up the computer to observe the simulated vitals of the dummy, keeping my back to the cameras, the screen is blocked from view. Of course, John is more interested in getting the looks on our faces than what we are actually doing. He enjoys it when we are nervous or about to cry from the trauma. The nerves on my face have nothing to do with the exercise. I need to be vigilant, but I'm also confident. As soon as he gives the signal to start shooting, I exit the monitor screen and head directly to the main database of the hospital. Thanks to the training I received in college, I know how to temporarily sign in with a code I was given to be on the show in the first place. The session expires in a few minutes. That is more than enough time to find out the information I'm looking for. I glance at the monitor, ensuring everything looks like it should. I return to the database, searching for Royce. I find him immediately. Here, I can learn everything the hospital knows about him, including his home address. I have nothing to write it down. Thankfully, after a few seconds, I memorize it well enough. The monitor starts beeping. I quickly exit the screen. The simulated vitals tell me there is too much blood loss. He's losing a lot of blood, let's make sure the pressure stays constant on that artery or we'll lose him. Mercedes gives me a look. I know we dislike each other, but we need to work together on this. The tension in the room is so strong it could be cut with a knife, but I stay calm. I have to get through this. Once I get through the afternoon, I'll head over to Royce's. I don't care if he will not talk to me at the hospital, I will not let him run forever. One way or another, I will talk to him. My heart races in my chest as I step out of the cab. The house isn't what I anticipated, but it's the right address. I always thought he lived in a mansion with a perfectly manicured yard and perhaps some fountains along the way. Unexpectedly, the dwelling looks quite normal. Toys are scattered about in the yard, signs that a child lives there. Between the holes in the grass and the treehouse in the oak, I'm sure little Maddox spends a lot of time outside. I walk up to the door, thinking of what I'll say. No doubt, he might feel stalked with me showing up on his doorstep, but I don't think he'll outright turn me away. He's better than that. I couldn't have imagined the feelings that are between us. It's a bond I've never felt before in my life. It has to mean something. I ring the doorbell and take a step back, breathing deeply. I need to calm myself if I'm going to get through this. The last thing I want to do is start ranting, or worse, start weeping. I'm so caught up in my thoughts, the opening door startles me, but I recover quickly. To my astonishment, it's not Royce, but another girl who looks close to my age. I rack my brain for who it might be, when I remember he has a nanny for Maddox. Hello. Can I help you, she asks. I smile warmly. Yes, didn't Royce tell you? I'll be taking over this evening with Maddox, I hope she buys the story, and relax when she looks confused. He didn't mention that, no, she says. I do have an appointment I am running late for. He probably forgot to mention it. No doubt. He's such a busy guy. With all that's going on at his work, he only remembered to ask me to watch Maddox and didn't tell you, I say with a laugh. She seems to relax further. At that moment, Maddox appears at her side. Kayla, he says, the enthusiasm in his voice. You're here. At this point, the sitter is convinced this story is true, and she invites me inside. Do you know your way around? More or less, I lie again. Royce will be here soon. I'll just watch my buddy Maddox in the meantime. Great, thank you so much, she says, heading for the door. I really appreciate it. The pleasure is all mine. I call after her. As soon as the door closes, I shake my head. That was way too easy. I need to bring it up to Royce. So what would you like to do? 
I ask, turning to Maddox. Let's play a game, he says as he runs to the living room. I want to play Sorry. Okay, I love that game, I comment as I follow him. I'm still nervous but feel much better now that I'm inside the house. I'm not sure how Royce will react when he finds me here instead of the nanny, but there is a part of me that doesn't care. No running from me this time, I'm finally getting the answers I've been waiting for. I should be prepared for whatever his feelings are, but I'm determined to handle it like an adult. I am an adult, after all, and I'll prove it to him. Chapter 13 Sorry I'm late, Misty. I stopped to have a drink with an old friend of mine and lost track of the time, I say as I enter my house. Misty usually doesn't mind staying a little later than usual to watch Maddox, but I hope she's not too late for her appointment. I round the corner to the living room and stop short. Kayla, not Misty, is sitting on the couch with Maddox playing a board game. What are you doing in my house? I shout. I'm infuriated. I don't know how she got my address. What could have possessed her to think it was a good idea to come inside, uninvited, and without telling me she was coming over? I have to talk to you, and you're avoiding me at the hospital, so I came here, she calmly replies. How did you get my address? That is confidential information. I looked it up, okay? Like I said, I have to talk to you, she remarks. Get out of my house. I don't want to talk to you. This is extremely inappropriate. I point toward the door, not bothering to keep my voice down. I'm so pissed off, I consider calling the cops. She rises, but crosses her arms defiantly and gives me a challenging look. I'll leave after you tell me what happened. One minute you behave like we're friends, then more than friends, then like I'm your enemy, she shouts. I don't want to discuss this in front of my son and worry he'll figure out what happened with Kayla. Maddox, go to your room, I snap. No. I want to stay with Kayla, he argues. Maddox. This is not the time. Go to your room now. I bellow. He bursts into tears and clings to Kayla, then looks at me with streaks running down his face. I want Kayla to be my nanny. I don't like Misty, he cries. You were fine with Misty right up until today. I try to make my voice gentle. But I need you to go to your room so I can talk with Kayla. Okay. He continues to cry, but Kayla gently pulls him off her. Listen, Maddox, I need to talk to your daddy about something. Be a good boy and go to your room, like he says. I want to stay with you. Maddox cries. She shakes her head. You go to your room, and I'll definitely say goodbye before I leave, okay? Promise, he asks. I promise. Maddox reluctantly obeys, walking out of the room without looking either of us. With him out of the way, I turn to her with the anger once again rising. Where do you get the audacity to barge into my house like that? I have every right to call the cops and file charges against you for trespassing. I want to talk to you, that's all, she says, her voice also rising with anger. I deserve at least that. You deserve nothing. I argue. You were just as eager to engage in that as I was. I thought it was something more. I feel like you used me, she snaps. Tears are filling her eyes. I feel like a jerk and sigh. Running my hand over the back of my neck, I'm trying to think of what to tell her. The best thing is to simply tell her the truth and now, as we're alone, is the best time to do it. I'm sorry. I didn't take advantage of you. Do you really want to know what's going on? I ask, maintaining a much calmer tone. She relaxes and nods. That's all I want. The fact is, I'm intensely attracted to you, Kayla. From the day I saw you. You had this command over me. At first I hated it. With time, I grew to love it. I'm reluctant, not sure how much to share with her. She seems pleased with what she hears but there's also hesitation in her face. So what happened? I hope you realize our relationship is not appropriate. You're a brilliant young woman. You are at the beginning of a career, and I'm in the middle of mine. 
I can't have that sort of relationship with you. Something like this could turn into a nationwide scandal. I don't want that for either of us. She's upset but takes a deep breath. I don't understand how this is a scandal. I am old enough to date who I want, and you are not my boss. No, but you are an intern in my hospital. With the way the show is set up, I am your superior. If viewers see that we are intimate, they will assume you are sleeping your way to the top. You and I know that didn't happen, but once the rumor is out, it'll be tough to beat. Especially with the gossip about the show anyway, I say. She gulps, taking a deep breath, clearly fighting all the emotion rising inside her. Finally, she nods and forces a smile. I don't like it but I understand, and you are right. I want to sigh with relief but that's not what she wants to see. This hurts me as much as her, but I've learned to handle my emotions even when I'm in a lot of pain. Thank you for taking the time to explain it, she says. I better move on. Wait a second. At least stay for dinner, I press. Even if you and I can't be romantic, I would prefer to be on good terms. She looks torn. It's difficult for her, being attracted to me, yet unable to act on it. Perhaps dinner is a bad idea, but it'll make me feel better. She needs to know I care. Even if it was a blunder for us to get together, and it can't happen again. At last she nods. All right, but I need to leave shortly after. I'll call you a cab, I say quickly. You can't possibly walk from here to your hotel. I appreciate it, she replies. So what's for dinner? I smile. Misty usually cooks something but she's gone. I grab my phone. I think we better do takeout. Wonderful, she says as she sits down. I could use a change from room service. I smile. Seeing Kayla outside the hospital is more strenuous than working with her, but I'm glad she decided to stay. It won't be easy moving forward, but this is the closure we need. We'll put this gaffe behind us and continue as friends. I've been through tougher situations in my life and come out stronger on the other side. This will not be easy, but it's the right thing to do. Thank God she's mature enough to understand. Kayla is even more perfect than I supposed. Chapter 14 There's no doubt the talk with Royce altered a lot for me. It's exceptionally difficult to work with him now, although he's lightened up once again. The other night I stayed longer after dinner than planned, but we chatted, and it was not easy to wrap it up. I still admire Royce, and I have grown to adore his son as well. Maddox has made it clear how he feels about me, and I would consider giving up medical school if I had a chance to be his nanny. It wouldn't be easy, but at least then I could see Royce every day. I know it would be a bigger problem than what I am already dealing with. I couldn't bring myself to be that close to him. I need to get over him. I have no choice but to comply with his decision. When this is all over, whether or not I win the final, I'm going back to Chicago and will leave him behind. The only healthy thing to do is to get over him completely, as difficult as it may be. I've loved Royce since I was old enough to know what love is. I've devoured every bit of information I could find about him. I've dreamt about being with him. And I'm not ashamed to say, I've fantasized about it as well. Throughout high school and trying to get into college, my motto was, if Royce did it, I can do it too. He was my imaginary support system, and now, knowing how he really is, knowing the truth about our circumstances, I can't dream about him as I once did. It's not healthy for me, and will make matters worse in the long run. What could be worse, to give up and go home now or should I press on for the title of top surgeon? Considering what's happened, I'm not sure I even want it anymore. I almost want my life to go back to the way it was before I came out to LA. Sure it was stressful and largely boring, but a lot easier than what I'm dealing with now. At least I didn't have a broken heart and no friend to talk to. I can't just tell anyone what happened, and I hesitate to ever tell Monique. The fact of the matter is, I'm lonely. I'm sitting in the hotel room, with no one to talk to and nothing to do. I don't want to volunteer at the hospital, and though I want to see Royce, 
it's a terrible idea. Focus on getting over him. I have to focus on me. I hate the lack of fulfillment. This was supposed to be a life-changing occasion, launching me into the perfect career, but instead it's proving to be one of the biggest errors I've made in college. I know reality TV thrives on drama, but had no idea it could get buried in my relationships. I sigh as I rise from the bed and throw on a tank top. I need to burn some energy. I'm tired of studying and proving a point to Royce. He might care for me, but that's not enough to take a chance with me, so why bother impressing him? It's time to take care of myself and that's what I'll do. I decide to go for a jog and clear my head, ignoring all my feeling and events of the past few days. Only a couple more weeks of shooting, then I'm free to move on with my life. It might mean I receive the title, and things go back to the way they were. I'll have nothing more than a fairy tale memory that ended in heartbreak. Either way, right now I have to get out of this hotel room to renew my mindset and focal point. Chapter 15 Daddy, Daddy. You're home. Maddox shouts when I walk through the door. He's always so happy to see me. I kneel as he throws himself into my arms. Did you have a good day, buddy? I ask. He nods excitedly. We get to see Kayla tonight. Misty walks into the foyer and smiles wearily. He's been talking about it all day. He's really taken with that girl. He is. I don't mind. It's good for him to have someone like that in his life. How are things for you? I like Misty but she gets involved in my affairs more than I would like. I'm okay, it's been a long day, she observes. I've got everything taken care of. You can end your day now. She thanks me and returns into the kitchen to get her things. Thank you, Misty. I call after her as she walks out the door. I'm glad she's working for me, especially the nights she makes dinner and keeps it warm on the stove. I've told her many times that she is more than welcome to stay and eat with us, but she always declines the invitation. We sit down at the table, and Maddox happily digs into his food. Misty knows what he likes and prepares it often, although some nights healthy eating wins. I chuckle as he shovels the broccoli, cheese and macaroni into his mouth, but then I remind him to slow down. You will choke if you are not careful, I warn. I will not choke, I want to hurry so I can see Kayla, he exclaims. I'm glad he likes watching her on TV and worry what will happen when the series is over and she has to leave. I would prefer he didn't go to the hospital with a TV crew around. I allow Misty to bring him by a couple times a week so he can say hello to Kayla between shootings. A part of me knows it's a bad idea allowing him to get fond of her, but another part wants him to experience her companionship while he can. He doesn't have many friends, thanks to the privacy I keep him under. He seems much happier since he met her. Thunder rolls in the distance. Maddox stops eating. Daddy? It will not hurt you, bud, we are safe inside, I remind him. Ever since the car accident, he's been terrified of thunderstorms. I can't say I blame him. It was the torrential rain and a pitch black night that contributed to the wreck. Without a doubt, he connects the two, though he is too young to understand what happened. I admit they aren't my favorite things in the world either, but once again, I hide my emotions. I will not show anxiety around Maddox. I'll be brave and strong for him, even if the thunder makes me want to down several shots of whiskey and pass out. Hurry up with your dinner so you can take a bath before the storm hits, I say. He takes a few more bites of his mac and cheese and scoots his plate away. I'm not hungry anymore, he announces. Don't let the storm bother you. Take a few more bites, I encourage. He shakes his head but I'm firm. You need to eat your vegetables if you want to grow up to be big and strong. I don't like broccoli, he whines. Eat one of them for me, I urge. No. Kayla likes broccoli, I say. I don't know what comes over me to tell him, but I'll use anything that encourages him to take a few bites of his greens. She does, he asks with wide eyes. Yup. I see her eat it for lunch. Maybe next time you can ask her about it. 
You want to tell her that you ate all of yours, don't you? I ask. I'll tell her I ate one of mine, he says proudly, shoving a piece in his mouth. He gags on it, but manages to swallow with the help of his milk. I smile. I can't believe how fast he's growing. All right, take your bath so we can watch the show, I tell him. He descends from the chair and disappears down the hall. I finish my own dinner alone. My mind wanders back to the day. Kayla looked so good in her uniform. It's been a week since we talked. I've been systematically denying I feel anything for her but lust. I try to tell myself it was nothing more than two people attracted to each other and making the most of the opportunity, but I know that's not true. I even checked the hospital's policies on dating among co-workers this afternoon. Common sense tells me there's no way it will happen. I need to let it go. Only a few weeks of the series remain, and then she's going back to Chicago. A sense of relief accompanies the fact she will not be here anymore. I dread the finale with everything in me. John has all but told me they're giving the title to Kayla. It was a close call between her and Mercedes. I'm not saying a thing, but I am happy for Kayla. All of a sudden a loud clash of thunder shakes the house, and at once everything goes dark. Daddy. Maddox screams from his room. I get up and sprint to him, catching him in my arms as he comes running. The power just went out little buddy, I say reassuringly. It's all right. It will be back soon enough. Can we watch Kayla, he asks. I show him that the TV won't turn on. The power might come on before the show is over, I say hopefully, but I can see he's disenchanted. Hey, don't be upset, you know it'll be on again tomorrow night if we don't see it tonight. He brightens up a little, but I can see he's still displeased. I tell you what, I'll get some flashlights and we can read one of your books in the dark. It'll be like we're camping, all right? Okay, he says cheerfully. I head to the closet to get the flashlights, disappointed that we won't watch the show. I shouldn't keep exposing myself to Kayla, but I can't help it. She's become my medicine. I wake up to find Maddox asleep on the couch next to me. The power never returned during the night. This morning, the lights are on in the hall and the dining room, and glancing at my phone I see that it is early. I have an hour before Misty arrives but get up anyway. I need to shower and shave and with Maddox still asleep, it's a great time to do it. I slide off the couch, careful not to wake him, and stroll to the bathroom. As I set my phone on the counter, it buzzes three times. John is already texting despite the fact it's five in the morning. Did you see the show last night? Wow. I can't believe the ratings. I thought things were going well, but this is through the roof. I've been talking to the network, and they are thrilled how the show is going. They want to start filming for season two immediately. As it turns out, Kayla's popularity is why it's doing so well. We're inviting her back for the next season. I skim the message and shake my head. I don't want to deal with Kayla for another two and a half months. John's enthusiasm tells me this is really happening. Are you sure she'll want to come back? I have the impression she's ready for this to be over. Send. His answer comes almost immediately. You know kids these days. With a big enough paycheck and some seniority over the next group of interns, she'll be more than happy to oblige. I'm thinking of you mentoring her and her mentoring them. She will not be competing, but she'll play an active role on set. I set my phone on the counter without bothering to answer. This is a terrible idea, but John will do what he wants. I only hope Kayla has the sense to turn him down. I pray she does. Chapter 16 It was a long day at the hospital, and I'm happy to be back in the hotel room where I can relax and focus on the finale. I've survived all the eliminations, and it's down to me and Mercedes. I'm not surprised. John really likes both of us. I have a feeling there is more to the voting than how well we're doing in the challenges. Since Royce and I had that conversation, he's given me more space. He's nicer to me, 
but he makes effort to treat all the remaining interns the same, even Mercedes. I get the impression he doesn't care for her much either, but with his position on the show, he's not able to change how he's handling anyone. I slowly open my eyes. Anxiety and resentment of the night before flood back into my brain. I don't care if I'm not supposed to be at the hospital prior to the shoot. I'll be there first thing, like Royce. I get out of bed. Instantly, a wave of nausea almost knocks me off my feet. I double over, holding my stomach as I taste bile. I scamper to the bathroom, fall to my knees and vomit in the toilet. I'm confused. I hardly ate a thing the day before. Come to think of it, I haven't had much of an appetite lately. I felt more tired than usual, but I've blamed it on working so hard. Now I can't recall when I had my last period. Longer than a month. With all that's been going on with Royce and the show, I did not think of it, but now a sinking feeling in my stomach overwhelms me. After dragging myself out of the bathroom and fighting the nausea for nearly an hour, I hurry out of the hotel to the nearest convenience store. I buy a pregnancy test and hurry back to my room, with each step praying it displays a negative. Moments later, I sit on the toilet with my pants around my ankles, staring at the two lines in the little box. It's positive. I'm pregnant. How can it be? I only missed one pill on my last pack, and it was shortly before my period. The timing was off and the odds were extremely slim. My eyes dart around the bathroom. I'm too lost in thought to see clearly. As if this day wasn't bad enough, now I have to find a way to tell Royce I'm pregnant. This will solidify what the series was trying to portray. A scandal is unfolding before me, and I feel powerless to stop it. If one thing's for sure, my life just got a lot more complicated. Chapter 17 You've got to be kidding me, I say as I watch the clip. I had no idea John followed Kayla to my house. I am beyond pissed. He had the nerve to add it to the series without talking to me first. It's too late to keep it from airing, but I'll fix it as soon as I can. I know if Kayla hears about the episode, she'll be distressed. This is exactly what I didn't want to happen. And even with my preventative measures, it occurred. With the thunderstorm knocking out the power, I just figured I'd watch it later. When another doctor at the hospital commented about the episode, I realized what was in it. I'd get a hold of the producers as soon as I could if I were you, he says through the phone. This could ruin your reputation, and eventually your career. Don't you think I know that? It's the reason I haven't been close to a single intern on set. I don't specify that it's only Kayla I've avoided. It isn't something he needs to know. But his point is obvious, I have to talk to John. I'm ready to go to work as soon as Misty walks through the door. I quickly tell her I'll be coming back late tonight. There are a few things I need to take care of. Okay, I'll be here, she replies with a smile. If she saw the episode, she has the sense not to talk about it. I thank her and leave, my mind spinning. I seethe on my way to the office, trying to think of what to tell John when I see him. He must know how much he messed up with this one, but I'm not sure he cares. It's defamation at its finest. There could be serious repercussions for myself, as well as Kayla. It wasn't reasonable to publish something like that when she's just starting out in the medical field. And it certainly isn't fair to me. John should know how precarious it is to bring up physical behavior in the medical practice. I could lose my license before they even bother to get through all the details of what really happened. I walk into the hospital with my shoulders squared and my jaw set. I don't want to see anyone but Kayla or John. I'll promise Kayla to take care of it and assure her nothing awful will happen. No doubt she'll be freaking out, but there's little I can do except tell her I'm fixing it. Where's John? I need to talk to him, I ask my assistant as soon as I'm in the office. She looks up in astonishment, then glances down at the piece of paper in front of her. I was supposed to tell you, he will not be in today. He called and said he's meeting with the network. The shooting is up to Peter. 
I don't want to talk to Peter, I need to talk to John. She gives me a look. I know it's not her fault John's not coming in, but I've got to take my frustration out on someone. I'm sorry. If I knew you needed to talk to him, I would have mentioned it would be best to come in before he drove to Hollywood, she apologizes. I hold up my hand to stop her. I know it's not your fault. I'm furious for what he did for the latest episode. I'm sure you saw it. She nods. I feel more tension growing inside me. I'm afraid it's been the gossip of the hospital. Who has seen it? The nurses like to chatter, and it won't be long before the story spreads like wildfire. Almost everyone by now. Ones who didn't see the premiere were interested in the clip when they heard about it. That's how I saw it, she says with a shrug. But I'm not judging you for it. I know how John likes to thrive on drama. He definitely made it look like something it wasn't. That's exactly what he did. I'm getting to the bottom of it. I signed a contract that protects me from this sort of nonsense. I can't believe he dodged that with some clandestine footage, I snap. He's supposed to be back tomorrow. I'm afraid there's not much we can do until then, she replies apologetically. I know. And that pisses me off all the more, I utter with a sigh. Are the finalists here yet? No, but if you ask my personal opinion, I would stay away from Kayla if I were you. I know you'll want to talk to her about it, but they will watch you like a hawk. They'll cram as much in as they can before the series is over. Without John to talk to, you never know what they'll find to weave in, she reminds me. I nod. She's right. I need to keep my distance from Kayla. It's not long before the finalists enter. I see a look of dread on Kayla's face. She appears a little sick but she's here regardless. It's now only her and Mercedes. I'm proud of her, even with the impending doom she'll finish this strong. That shows depth of character. Kayla, I'm sure someone told you by now what happened, I say quickly. She nods but she says nothing. Her face is pale, and I'm getting the impression she wants to answer but she can't. No doubt it's the nerves getting to her. I have to keep it brief, so I continue. I will take care of this, I promise. I need to talk to you alone. Not here and certainly not at my house. Here, this is my phone number and an address to a little coffee shop close to my house. Let's meet there after work and discuss how to handle this, I whispered. She takes the paper and looks into my eyes. Once again, it seems like she wants to say something but can't form the words. I glance around and put my hand on her shoulder. Everything will be all right. She nods. I quickly step away from her, eager to get through the rest of the day. I don't want to do more of these episodes, and I'll oppose the second season and make sure John gets what's coming to him. I'll make sure he pays dearly. Chapter 18 I walk into the coffee shop, my heart racing. I don't want to be seen in public with Royce, but don't know what else to do. This will impact my career. How will I recover from it? I want to disappear, to scream, to cry. I don't know what to do. Royce is seated in the corner of the shop, near the back where no one will disturb us. I approach the counter and order a peppermint tea, hoping it'll settle my stomach. Nausea has been bothering me all day, and it certainly hasn't helped being under this new stress. I need to tell Royce as soon as possible or before things worsen. Glad you made it, he exclaims. I nod, sit down, and give him a weak smile. I still can't find the words to speak to him. Look, I know this is all a shock to you but trust me, I'll take care of it, he assures me. I shake my head. How can you? The entire world has seen the footage by now. It made headlines this morning, so those who don't watch the show are bound to take a look at the clip. I'm ruined, you're ruined, and this whole situation is ruined. I fight the tears. He reaches over and puts his hand on top of mine. I fret that someone will see us but he seems unconcerned. I know you're worried. Trust me, you've never dealt with anything like this before. When you are in the public's eye, you have to be prepared for things like this. 
Even the best celebrity deals with such things from time to time. If I have to, I'll take John to court. I have a case, he says with a soft smile. That's just it, I'm not a celebrity. You might have a case but that will not serve me. Anyone who watches the show or anywhere I try to work will see this and decline to offer a position. You know our moral code. You and I broke it. Two stray tears run down my cheeks and Royce brushes them off my face. I'll take care of you. Do you really think I would forget about you? Of course not. I know this affects both of us. I will not let it stand. How will you manage that? John knows what he's doing when it comes to this scenario. He has produced some of the most controversial shows aired on television. Actually, I didn't know that. And quite frankly, I don't care. He's not getting away with this. When we started, I signed a contract with him and that protected my reputation. There is no solid proof you and I engaged in something inappropriate, he's breaching the contract. Any judge would throw his case right out of the courtroom for that, Royce explains with excitement in his voice. There is hope, Kayla, you just have to know how to work the system, he adds. I shake my head sadly once more. He looks at me, confused. What's wrong? There is concrete proof you and I engaged in things we shouldn't have, I say with a quivering voice. What do you mean? We were in my office when it happened. No one was around, I made sure of that when we left, he argues. That's not what I'm talking about. I learned this morning I'm pregnant, I say in a low tone, in case someone in the coffee shop is aware of what's going on. I'm afraid someone will video us on their phone or snap a photo and put it online. Royce is silent for a moment. Are you sure? Completely. But I'm on the pill. I mean, I missed one of them right before my period. That shouldn't have put me at that much risk, I say with another shake of my head. It's supposed to be fine if you miss a pill in the second half of the pack. He nods. I know, but there are times when accidents happen. You never know what your body will do. If you are referring to hormones, it's even more unpredictable. What are we going to do? I ask, my voice still shaking. Did you test at home? Maybe give it a couple of days and try again. Since you are on the pill, it might have been a false positive. I shake my head once more. I hoped for that. When I got to the hospital this morning, I had it checked with a blood test. The results were the same, there's no denying you and I are having a baby. He curses under his breath. I look down. He puts his hand over mine once more. I'm not upset about having a child. It'll complicate things, but I'll take care of you and the baby. Then what it is? I'm getting angry, frightened, and have no clue what will happen, but I'm relieved that he's not abandoning me. I'm worried they have the records at the hospital, he says with a sigh. Aren't medical records private? More annoyance in my voice. They are supposed to be, but it won't take much for one of the nurses to mention to John that a test was done. Of course, that's more ammunition on our part if it happens. That doesn't change the fact that it will muddy the house scene on the show. He doesn't mean to make me feel worse, but fear once again grips me as I think of my future. How can I take care of a child when I can't get a job? Do I need to drop out of school? Who will hire me now that this has come to light? So many emotions and thoughts run through my mind, I don't know what to believe. I'm ruined. I sob, burying my face in my hands. He grabs my wrists and pulls them down, then brushes the tears off my face again. No you are not, he says with a passion. I told you I'll look after you, and I mean that. I sit back in my chair and sigh. I want to believe him, but it's so hard to trust anyone. If there's anyone who can get me out of this mess, it's Royce. Let him handle it. But my fear won't let go. It tells me to leave. To run far, far away and never look back. Chapter 19 I don't care how I get there, I just need to get there today, I say through the phone. I know it's simple to get to Hollywood, but I have to clear my schedule with the hospital before I leave. I have patients who had an appointment today, 
but I can get away in an emergency. This is more important than missing a day of work, though I hope my patients understand. I have to find the file of the pregnancy before John puts it in the next episode. I have a feeling he'll produce that one sooner rather than later, keeping the audience interested in the so-called drama between me and Kayla. All right, it's set. I'm sure you know this will make it tough to accomplish next week, my secretary informs me through the phone. I don't care. I have more important things to worry about right now. She sighs but I finish the conversation. I don't care what anyone says about me leaving on a whim. The sooner I get to John, the better. I throw the few things I need in the car and am relieved to see Kayla walking through the parking lot. She looks worried. I smile as I stop her. I think you should go back to your room and hang out there today. I'd like that but what about shooting, she asks. Don't worry. I have a feeling that by the end of the day, there won't be more of this series. Forget about it all and rest easy, I assure her. She sighs and looks over her shoulder. The van is already leaving. She is in no condition to flag it down. I'll call you a cab, okay? Anyway, I'm on my way to Hollywood. I'll find John and talk to him about the footage. We'll get this worked out. I don't bother to hide the concern I feel for her. She's tired and worried, not like a proud mother who recently discovered she's having a baby. Okay. Don't bother going inside. Sit on that bench and a cab will be on the way shortly, I assure her. She smiles and walks toward the hospital. I slide into the driver's seat of my car. It's a quick call to have a taxi on the way and get out of the parking lot as soon as I can. I'm glad I didn't bother going inside the hospital. It would have been a lot harder than calling my secretary from my car. Once I'm on the freeway, I push the speed limit as much as I can. John didn't come back to LA like he was supposed to, and I'm even more frustrated at the liberties he's taking with my career. I'm getting to the bottom of this, and if it turns ugly, so be it. It's time someone put him in his place. Excuse me sir, you can't go in there, the secretary calls out behind me. I asked her where I could find John, and she made the mistake of telling me he was in a meeting, and what room that meeting was in. I don't give a damn what he says. I will talk to him, and I'll talk to him now. It will be even better if he's in a meeting with his superiors. I would love nothing more than to show them the things I've been dealing with working with John. What the hell? John exclaims when I burst through the doors. Can't you see I'm in the middle of something? Actually, I think now is the perfect time to discuss this, I reply nonchalantly. I think there are a few things you should reevaluate before putting them on TV. What are you talking about? He asks with a smirk. Oh, are you upset with the little exposure? The little exposure? I snap. That is defamation of character. I don't know what you think you're doing, pulling that little stunt, but that is a direct violation of our contract. Oh, is it? I told you I wouldn't put something compromising in unless you provided it to us, which you assured me you'd never do. So why the hell did an intern leave your house at that time of day? He crosses his arms, and I fight the urge to punch him in the face. She needed to talk to me. And tell me, what are you planning to do with the medical footage? I ask coolly. What medical footage? John asks. He knows exactly what I'm talking about, but he's playing dumb in front of his boss. Don't be a jerk. I know it's in here. I grab the file on the table. John leaps for it, but I manage to get it away and start flipping through the pages. Aha! Reveal Kayla is pregnant. It says so right here. That is information you have obtained illegally, and I have proof. What's he talking about? John's boss asks. I don't know, I have full permission from the young woman to air this, he says quickly. You don't, and I can prove it. I don't know about you, Mr. Thompson, I turn to John's boss, but I would hate for this series to blow up into a lawsuit. You have worked hard to be a reputable network, I can't imagine what this will do when I get lawyers involved. He looks uncomfortable, but John chimes in again. 
I don't know if you have a leg to stand on. You're in a bit of a tight spot yourself, wouldn't you say? He asks. I throw the contract down on the table and slap my finger on the line. It doesn't matter what I'm doing, you are legally bound to obey this and you are not. It says right here that I have the right to take full legal action against you, and trust me, I will. John pales and Mr. Thompson looks agitated. Finally, Mr. Thompson speaks up. What do you want to do about this? I want all the footage pulled, an apology from the network, and that footage of Kayla's information destroyed, I reply. Anything less and you can expect to hear from my lawyer. John tries to argue with me, but his boss steps in, holds his hand up and gives him a cold look. Do you realize how much this could cost the network? Our parent company could drop us over something like this, and if that happens, you are out of a job. I abided by the contract, but you know we need the ratings, John argues but Mr. Thompson isn't in the mood to hear it. You've messed up John. Pull the footage and meet Mr. Berkeley's other demands. Next time, I expect you to exhibit better judgment when you produce a reality TV show. These are people's lives you're dealing with, and they have to go on with those lives when the show is over, Mr. Thompson states. John looks defeated, but a wave of relief washes over me. I can't wait to get back to LA and tell Kayla the good news. As soon as I wrap up the final details with the two men, I'm back on the road, speeding to LA as fast as I can get there. The hotel tells me Kayla checked out that afternoon. She left no information where she was going, and no personal message for me. Confused, I call the hospital first and then her school, asking about the program that sent her out to LA in the first place. No one knows where she is, and no one has heard from her except for the hotel that afternoon. Kayla has vanished. Chapter 20 I'm nervously rocking back and forth in my seat and praying I'll make it through the border. All morning and into the afternoon, I tried to convince myself everything will be okay, but as time wore on and I didn't hear from Royce, the more convinced I became my life was falling apart right in front of me. The more public this situation became, the more I couldn't shake the feeling of wanting to disappear. There's no way Royce can convince a network to pull the footage. Certainly, John will come forth with the news of my pregnancy. I should have had the blood test at the clinic, but I didn't know employees at the hospital would release personal information. I struggled all afternoon, but no matter how hard I tried, the only solution I could come up with was to escape. I'm not far from Mexico. I know it will take a while by bus, but it's doable. I gathered the bit of money I had left and hit the road. Halfway there, I realized I didn't have my passport. I left it sitting on the dresser of my little apartment. I wish I'd slipped it into my purse on my way out the door. It would solve so many problems. On the bus, I avoid eye contact with other people. I imagine they wonder who I am and where I'm going. I know I look tired. I avoid looking at myself in a reflection. I'm such a mess. Paranoia is hinting that they must know who I am after watching the series, and I further assume all of them are judging me. A part of me wishes I had the guts to stay in LA and wait for Royce to return, but I don't know how to face him if he wasn't able to change a thing. I'm persistently sick to my stomach and recognize my best chance of starting over is where no one knows me across the border. Although Royce gave me his phone number, I never gave him mine, so I don't check my phone. I have no family to speak of and few friends. The only person I had to depend on was Monique. I feel lost in the world and not sure how I'll make it. The hours tick by, and I make the necessary bus connections. I avoid all cameras, so no one can put it on the internet where I'll be discovered. Everything will be all right at the border. I only have to make it that far. At long last, the final bus of the journey pulls to a stop. My heart races as I step out, slinging my bag over my shoulder. The bus does not cross. I'm traveling like a nomad and determined to keep going. I get in line with the other people who are crossing and still avoid eye contact. I'm sure no one recognizes me, but I'm not taking any chances. It's possible no one is looking for me but I presume they are, 
so I avoid being recognized by anyone. The man in front of me is permitted to pass, and with a newfound hope, I stride over to the officer. Buenos dias. Your name and reason for entering Mexico. I hand him my ID with a smile. Hi, my name is Kayla Grid and I'm thinking about moving here. Passport? He holds out his hand and I smile once more. I'm sorry, but it seems that I've forgotten my passport. But here's my identification. Can I please go through? It's really important, I plead. No, if you don't have a passport you aren't getting in. Please go back. He points in the direction I came from, and my heart races. You don't understand, it is very important I get through. I have a passport, it's just not with me, I explain. I don't care if you have ten passports. If you don't have them on you, you aren't coming through. Please go back, he points again. I try one more time. This is a bit of an emergency. I really hate to bother you but if you could just make the exception for me, I really have to get through, I say. Another agent walks over. I hope he has more compassion. What's going on? This young woman doesn't have a passport. She needs to be sent back, the officer explains. ID, the other officer inquires. The man hands him my ID, and he reviews it. You're Kayla Grid, 24 years old, from Chicago, Illinois. My heart leaps to my throat. Is he getting that information from the ID, or is there another way he knows my name? If this is the way to get into Mexico, I'll take the risk. I take a deep breath and nod with a smile. Yes, that's me. You need to follow me, he says. I'm confused. But I'm going south, I clarify. No, miss, you are coming with me for a few questions, he replies before he turns back to the first officer. Carry on. I'm not going with you. I've done nothing wrong and you can't make me. I turn to go, but he grabs my arm and holds me. Miss, I need you to cooperate. It'll be a lot easier if you do. Let go of me. I've done nothing wrong. I cry. But he doesn't listen. Instead, he puts me in handcuffs and leads me toward the station. My heart races. I have done nothing wrong, yet I've been placed under arrest. I want to scream, but with the people already staring, it'll curtail the situation if I keep my mouth shut. How dare you take me like this? I hiss. You've been reported missing, and we need to straighten it out before you can leave, he retorts. My heart continues to pound in my chest. The only person I can envision looking for me is Royce. Considering I was on the show, I suspect this will make national news. I can't believe how everything has fallen apart. I've ruined my life, and it's only getting worse. I will not talk to him and give him more information. I should figure out how to get out of here. Chapter 21 The room has an echo. I'm waiting for word about Kayla. Someone spotted her on a bus to San Diego. Something tells me she wants to flee to Mexico. And here she is, the officer announces as he walks into the room. My heart skips a beat when I see Kayla. She looks scared but seems relieved when she sees me. Can we have a few minutes? I ask the officer. He hesitates but nods and leaves the room. I jump out of my chair to Kayla. What the hell are you doing? Why did you leave? I can't go back there. I've ruined my life. I don't want to keep going with that awful show. You don't have to. They are pulling the series from the network. They won't generate anything else. I told you I'd take care of it and I did. You just need to trust me, I shake of my head. She looks embarrassed but defiant. I've never been able to trust anyone in my entire life, she replies. That has to change. Look, I've come to take you home. I want to be with you, Kayla. We're having a baby, together. It's only fair we try to make things work. You and I get along great, there's no reason why we can't. I don't care if I have to plead with her. I know what I want, and I'm letting her know. She looks at me and shakes her head. My heart sinks. 
I thought there was no way for us to be together. You were an intern then. Now you can do what you wish. I don't want you to give up on your dream, Kayla. I'll help you get through school, and you'll become a surgeon, I promise. There is suspicion in her eyes. I sigh. I tell you what, let's just get out of here. We can talk about it on the way back, okay? She nods after a brief pause. Let's go. It's not the best hotel, but it's something, and I got us two beds, I mention as we step into the room we checked into for the night. She looks around. Two beds, she asks. I didn't want you to feel pressure. I really do care about you, Kayla. I want things to work out between us. I. I love you. The words slip out before I have the chance to think about them. She looks at me in revelation. They have a profound effect on her. She looks down at her belly, placing her hand over it. Are you sure? I've never been more certain about anything in my life. I step forward and press my lips to hers. This is the moment I've been waiting for. No one will interrupt us, and no one will say we cannot be together. This is exactly what we need. Neither of us speaks at first but then Kayla scoots up and leans her head on my chest. Do you really think we can make it work? she asks. I have no doubt. I love you, Kayla. I love you too, she says quietly. She sighs, running her fingers over my chest. I take her hand in my own and give it a light squeeze. It will not be simple, but I will keep my pledge. We will be happy together for a long time. I'm confident of it. The End Thank you for listening to this audiobook. Audio Copyright 2023 BFA Publishing Please like and subscribe to support this channel, it helps more than you know.